Hello everyone and welcome back to Willow's Notes. In today's video, we will talk all about signal transduction. In the introduction to the three stages of cell signaling, we identified the stages as reception, where the signal binds to the receptor, transduction, where changes take place in a series of different molecules, in a signal transduction pathway. This is the focus of today's video. And of course, finally, response, where the cell responds to the signal. After the signal binding to its receptor and the receptor changing shape, a series of proteins are activated inside the cell. However, not all the components in the signal transduction are proteins. In many pathways, there are small water-soluble molecules and ions that act as second messengers. The most common and widely used second messengers are cyclic AMP and calcium. So why do we call them second messengers? The first messenger is the signal. Okay, for example, the hormone in this case that initially binds to the receptor and starts the whole thing. Once that first signal is received, a message needs to be sent and amplified within the cell. And that's the job of the second messenger. What is cyclic AMP? Adenyl cyclase is an enzyme that is found on the membrane Remember that G protein can activate it. So once the signal is bound and the adenylcyclase is active, it catalyzes the conversion of ATP to cyclic AMP. Now, adenylcyclase will not only convert one molecule of ATP, rather it's going to convert a lot of ATP molecules. And because cyclic AMP is small and water soluble, it can spread throughout the cell through diffusion. Okay, so this is a way to amplify the message within the cytoplasm. And of course, in the absence of a signal, cyclic AMP will be converted back to ATP by another enzyme called phosphodiesterase. The high levels of cyclic AMP activate a protein kinase. We covered kinases in a previous video, but let's summarize it again real quick. A kinase adds a phosphate group on a protein to activate it. Now, the addition of the phosphate changes the three-dimensional shape. As you can see here, the shape of the protein is different. And now, because the phosphate group is added, the whole shape of the protein changes. It is like a final step of modification that makes the protein active. Adding a phosphate group is known as phosphorylating. So kinases, they phosphorylate the protein. Now that this protein kinase is active, it will phosphorylate an inactive protein kinase. And now that this protein kinase is active, it will go ahead and activate another protein kinase. This pathway is known as phosphorylation cascade. Why? Because it's a cascade. It's a series of successive events, one protein phosphorylating another, and hence phosphorylation cascade. In the phosphorylation cascade, other than kinases, phosphatases are also very important because the activated proteins cannot stay activated forever. Otherwise, the response will never stop. Therefore, the phosphatases, they dephosphorylate, meaning they remove the phosphate group from the protein kinases, turning off the signal, turning off the whole transduction pathway. And of course, all of this takes place when the initial signal is no longer present. The signal transduction pathway will lead to the regulation of the cell's activities. All of this happened because we want to regulate. We want the cell to do something. And what the cell will do, the response of the cell, may either take place within the nucleus or in the cytoplasm. And of course, we will look more closely at the response in our next video. And this is it for today. 
I hope you found it easy, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!